lot of firsts. And so, Christy, talk to us a little bit about your journey um, and how you got here. Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, first, I want to start by a great call out on the, the Inclusion Cafe and making that such a central part to what you're doing. Um, it's super important, and I'm really excited to see the work you're, you're all doing. Um, so I, I think I get 50 bucks if I start my story back with, I was born in Aurora, Illinois, uh, which if you watch the movie Wayne's World, you know exactly what that means. So the fact that I went from there to here, can I get some applause? <laughs> Um, you know, I've, I grew up in the business, in the media, on the media side of the business, having been at a lot of the big creative branding agencies um, throughout my career. And um, as someone who really understood the importance of creating engaging advertising and making sure that you put it in front of the person at the right time, I've always been looking for a better way from a media perspective because you see all this really rich content, but getting it in front of the right person at the right time seems, seems to be somewhat elusive, which you can Still. relate to too. Yeah, you can relate to it as well. So I've always been on this path to try to find a way where it's a, what I like to call a win-win-win, where the brand wins, uh, the retail, especially in this case, the retailer wins, but most importantly, that the, that the customer wins, um, that they're seeing the content and the messaging that they're interested in. So I did the creative agency side, then actually went to one of the big media holding companies. Uh, and um, from there was actually uh, tapped on the shoulder by Target to come head up their entire media practice. And out of that practice was born Roundell, which was their entrance into the retail media space. And, um, you know, it's such an interesting space because it's incredibly valuable to retailers. Um, but at its best, it's actually even more valuable to the customers, to consumers, because we're giving them the information and the engagement that they're looking for. Uh, and I also love the idea of most of us are approaching the market as a, what I like to call a co-op garden. So we're not a walled garden, uh, we're a co-op like garden. Our intent is to drive this accessibility, transparency in the industry. And so to be these big scaled media solutions in the marketplace that haven't been around before and to have it be transparent is really transformative for the industry. That's great. I, I not only remember um, how much of an advocate you were on the creative agency side in terms of integration, but really keeping the end customer in mind and working on so many iconic brands. I, you know, before we jump into retail media networks, I just, I just want to ask you, how do you feel about women in the industry? I mean, obviously a lot of women come up through media. Do they stick when they get to the middle? Um, and what's been your secret sauce? How have you mentored as many people as you have? And what do you want to share with the audience? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll, um, if you look at how generations who have come into the marketplace after I did, um, there is a very rapidly evolving way that people want to be led and managed. And I actually think that w women learn that. We're, we're, we're naturally wired for that more, like we don't have to conquer something, we want to bring everything along. And that, you know, that management style is something that comes really naturally to us. So one of the things that, you know, there are a couple of things that I share with the women that I mentor. First off, trust what you know. So many times we're quiet for multiple years in our career because we're not quite sure we, we got it right, and so we listen, and we're like, they just said what I could have said 15 minutes ago. Oh, um, so trust that you know it. Uh, and then the other piece is just, you know, trust that the, you know, being vulnerable in the workplace is actually a strength, it's a superpower, and it's the way that people really buy into you as a leader is by showing that you, you have weaknesses too. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's a requirement now, especially when you look at some of the generations that are entering the marketplace now, um, they require that you show up with vulnerability, otherwise they don't trust you, and they're not gonna buy into what you're asking them to do. So appreciate that. I think um, you know, as we look at new frontiers, like radio, retail media networks, you know, you have to consider the fact that this intersectional generation 
um, is also looking at our industry differently than we ever looked at it. So I appreciate what you're saying about women leaders, et cetera. Let's, let's dive into what a retail media network is. And the reason I say that is, you know, the topic for this panel is really getting into things like standardization. But before we get into it, I like to call the sausage making. The truth of the matter is we have to level set. What's the landscape? How is it different than Chopper? How do we talk about this? Because, you know, we're really excited about the fact that there's a consumer opportunity at the other end of this. We talked about it and you just talked about it a few minutes ago that is pretty special when you think about the fact that from a media moment all the way through to a sale and then back around, you can actually get to know the consumer on a pretty local level when you consider some place like Albertsons as an example. But tell us about the landscape. How is it different than Shopper? And set the table for us. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So Shopper started as the Sunday Circular, the wall of TVs in the big box store, um, the signs at the end of the aisle that kind of you know extol the virtues of the brand and then it's on sale. And then what started to happen is that as shoppers started to become more digital, as we started to gather more data on shoppers as a result of loyalty programs, it suddenly became apparent with our websites and our apps that we were now starting to sit on the makings of a media company, not just point of purchase media uh, that we had been doing before. So um, once you started to really lift the hood and realize, like at Albertsons, I can, um, I have 100, 106 million marketable adult, real people consumers, real people doing real things that we can bring to the market that people can advertise to. And then on the other end of that, especially if you're a CPG, I can, I can prove that the product actually moved out of the stores. And so it is the perfect media situation if you think about it. And why people are getting really excited about it now is that there is going to be a lot of data, uh, I, I, between, between two friends talking, I call it crap data, <laughs> that's gonna come out of the marketplace. And so um, advertisers are looking for other high quality data sources. And this isn't just another data source, it's actually an improvement because it's based on first party, it's privacy compliant in the way that we gather it. Uh, we have, everyone is opted in, uh, we, we handle it in a really appropriate way. So now what has been based on cookies is going to be based on real people activities, which it's an upgrade. Uh, and so people see that coming and are super excited about it. I, I love the fact that, um, first of all, you're seeing these people, what, twice a week. Yes. And so you're not talking about incidental data or opportunities that are coming once a quarter, et cetera. And so that intimacy. Everybody that's been talking all morning on the panels um, have been talking about relevance. This is hyper relevance and such an, we own a location company, so we understand you know, how hyper relevant some data can be if used properly and in a connected way. And I love the fact that you're seeing folks twice a week. Yeah, and if any of you shop at any of the Albertson stores, we have 20 some brands that sit under our umbrella. Um, think Safeway, Jewel Osco. Uh, these are really big local brands that you know. Every single one of the stores is uh, merchandised to meet the customers that shop it. And so to be able to bring that same kind of customization to marketing, to digital marketing. Online is, and offline. Online and offline is just super interesting to us. And our, the sales that we're tracking are all sales. So it's store as well as online shopping. Um, so we've, we're covering it all, two and a half times a week, as you say, on average, is how often we see these people. That's amazing. I definitely am going to the store too often. Um, I, I think that just as we dive into more of how it's all done and standardization, which was our topic, um, one of the things that you know comes to mind is there's clearly a landscape that's being pulled together by about 100 companies, let's say, and, and I think the premier end of the market's probably 20 companies. But I'm going to let you talk a little bit about that from the inside out. In terms of the fragmentation in retail media? That's or correct. The, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Every day there's a new retail media company I that pops that. up. Uh, so there are, if you think about it, there's, yes, there's probably 10 or fewer that represent the bulk of the um, shopping that's going on out in the world. Then there's some, there's a group 
the, kind of the middle tail. Um, so the, think of the biggest ones, Walmart, uh, Kroger, Target, Albertsons, Lowe's, um, sees a, and Home Depot, they see a lot of volume. Best Buy sees a lot of volume. Then after that, um, you start to see retail media networks that have a lot of value, but they just don't see their customers as frequently. And um, so to understand what the differences are is really important, and that's a lot of what we'll get into when we talk about standardization. Um, but even take a company like Instacart. They have a very different shopping occasion than the shopping occasions that we see. A lot of value to what they represent and what they actually know, but it's not the same of what we know in terms of seeing our customers two and a half times a week. They have that shopping trip that you, some days you go in with the cart and you overfill it, and some days you just need right. a couple of things and you want to have it delivered. Um, so that's a very different need that you have in that moment, but there's a lot of value to market toward in one occasion versus another. Um, and so really understanding what the value is of each retail media network is an important piece. Then you have a lot of people, companies that are aggregating the middle and the long tail. So Critio, Instacart, yeah. uh, the announcement that Publicis just had with their kind of the, the Publicis media group that they're bringing out. Those are really great aggregators, um, which is you know a, a nice way to simplify that long tail. It probably bodes well that there's some aggregation, I guess, in the market. I think there's probably some decrement in terms of the level of personalization and specificity. Um, as we think about standardization, I mean, you know, we went through this in digital at large. <laughs> I think I lived through it. <laughs> we both did. Um, but we remember the pain. <laughs> yes. Um, I think here, let's talk a little bit about what you guys are doing in terms of ad sizes and data privacy and all the consistency that needs to happen across the standardization realm. Yeah, and uh, this is one of the reasons why standardization is such a big topic in our media sector right now. We're hearing loud and clear from our clients that it is too complicated to have to figure out how each of us does our, does our thing. Uh, yeah, we're all, sn we're snowflakes is the way that I like it to talk about it. And it all depends on how we grew up as a retail media network. And so uh, CPGs in particular are having to take the time to standardize us with each other so that they know how to compare the results um, from one to the other. And um, they, that's not sustainable for them. So they're hiring people to try to normalize us, which is, that sh that's on us. They shouldn't have to do that. If we don't take the, the friction out of engaging with us, uh, they won't invest in us as wholeheartedly as they could and should. And you have um, some things coming up that I think um, might be interesting. What, what's on your plate in the short run? Yeah, I mean, we always have kind of the, what are we doing to make the base business as fluid and um, I'll call it profitable for our CPGs yeah. as possible. So driving as much growth, you know, incrementality. Uh, so we're always doing a lot of work on the, the base side of the business and then we always have a really aggressive innovation agenda that we're doing at the same time. And uh, around the base business, it's leaning into the conversation around standardization. Um, because there's a lot of talk, um, and there are some activities that are going on, but to try to, you know, to, to try to bring them together is an important piece. And then on the innovation agenda, it's how do we take our most valuable assets, which is the first party data and these audiences we can build, and then the closed loop reporting that we can do, the measurement that we can do, and bring those to the market in a different way. And an easy example is how we integrate into the trade desk so that um, ad certain advertisers can go in, they, our audiences are already built in there for them and the measurement is part of it too. So then they can just go and open web and see TV and start to place their own buys. So we take the media part that we've typically bundled with our audiences and our measurement and taking that out of the equation and letting the advertiser bring that part. What, what do, you, do you think we've made enough progress to date, or have you guys, obviously you have your innovation agenda, have you, do you feel like you made enough progress, or is it really about RMNs in general making more progress? 
I think it's RMNs in general making more I similar so progress. Yeah. Like starting to just make it easier for everyone. And Take the mystery out of it. And there'll be that collaboration, right? I mean, at some point, clearly, we'll have not just standards, but there'll be real collaboration as we adjudicate against you know, customers and that end message. Yeah, and one of the, I do want to call out because it, you, know, you referenced what, what we were joking about programmatic in the 1990s. Um, and this is really, retail media needs to go through that same kind of upheaval to kind of clean it up so it's just easier. So the IAB is doing a ton of work in that space and are going to be a great partner for retail media. In particular, the ANA is doing a lot to help brands. So the industry is starting to coalesce around it, um, and I, this will be a big year for it. How do you think the agencies are approaching the topic, and do you feel like if you could call out and say, you know, here's how you jump on board with us, what, what would you say to them? Yeah, there's um, each holding company has a different way of engaging. Um, and then each CPG in their agency ecosystem has a different way of engaging because, you know, some have planning and buying in-house, some have their agencies doing part of it. I'm so surprised. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, I, 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 the holding companies, so some lean way in on the innovation side. And so they're trying to figure out how can I work with you with your data and your measurement and really bring kind of this performance uh, kind of media proposition back to their clients that has more of a commitment to driving outcomes, which is super interesting. And then others who think of it as, I should probably be doing upfront buying with retail media. Like, why wouldn't you if you're already doing it with all of the other media types oh, yeah. as well? And I think that you'll start to see more of that going into 24. Makes sense. I, I'll give you a breather for a second and just say one of the things that we've been focused on since I've been at Infilian is really finding a way not only to engage the customer in hyper-relevant ways, but to really focus on respecting their time, attention, and privacy. And one of the reasons this talk has come about and feel so lucky to be here with Christy is I feel like what our MNs are going to do and what you guys are focused on really delivers on that. I think this idea of delivering on respecting consumers' time, attention, and privacy. They're opting in. They really want it. They're looking at units they want to look at, et cetera. Any comment on that, just out of curiosity, that little trifecta? Yeah, and I, um, it is the promise that we've made to our customers. And um, the second we break that promise, the whole proposition falls apart, and it should. Um, we're all consumers. We know when a brand or a business or somebody has gone too far. We know when they're not living up to what I thought was the commitment that we made to each other. Um, and so that's first and foremost for us, is to make sure that everything that we do is within that promise that we made to our customers. And we have to serve them properly. If they start getting a bunch of random ads because our targeting isn't quite right or we cut a corner in the technology, uh, that'll be, you know, we'll, we'll get opted out. I mean, you're talking about real scale across a very broad swath of customers, so that responsibility goes deep. Do you feel like you're doing something different, better at Albertsons? I mean, you've had other experiences. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how you guys are, are fine-tuning that? Give us a few tips. Yeah, I think um, probably the thing, just because of the nature of our business, is we are far more local than most. And that if you think about each of our stores grew up serving the community that they're in, um, and it just started to aggregate into this big national footprint. Um, and so I think that we are especially good at the local part. But the other piece is just the philosophy of Albertsons overall, which is life happens around food. And as long as we continue to remember the importance that food plays in our wellness, but also in the way that we nurture each other, it's quite a lovely place to play. And it has a lot of heart and humanity, and that's something that we try to make sure we keep bringing is that heart and humanity side of it. That's amazing. Thank you for saying that. I, um, I know this is a little bit of a, a consistent question and fireside chats or discussions, but in this case, look out five years. Um, how, how do you see this playing out? What's going to happen five years from now in the retail media network space? Yeah, m my dream. <laughs> I mean, a couple of things. I would love to see us having a role in linear TV. 
right? Yes. You know, how long have we been uh, using Nielsen data with broad demographics and impressions as a way to show that television worked when we can add to that uh, more specific audiences and proof that somebody actually went to a store and bought something. Um, so I think that's going to be super exciting. I also um, see us not getting to a place where we're not being compared to each other, but we're compared to Facebook, uh, Google, and you know we have the scale to be that large of a media sector. Uh, and I think five years from now, we could absolutely claim that spot if we take the friction out of just being able to track one row as from one retail media network to the other. That's great. I, I was talking to a friend and we were talking about the opportunity that you know, what you're doing can have on product selection. You know, uh, what are your buyers looking at, et cetera? And it just has such a profound opportunity. We have a profound opportunity to impact health overall and uh, so many other things in you know, health deserts, et cetera. So really proud of what you're doing. And um, I, I wanna make sure that we give the audience some time for questions. But tell me, is there anything that you would like to end with um, that uh, you are doing that you'd like the audience to know before we turn it over to them? Yeah, I think the most important thing is that I would love the audience to know that I want to hear from you. Like, what are the gaps that you're seeing in the general media marketplace? And as we grow up as a new media sector, what, are, what else can we build into the proposition that actually is a big unlock? Um, for the industry overall and I, you know I couldn't help but listen to the prior panel and you know see the opportunity that we have in this industry to just open up the boundaries more and to really come to the market representing the market. That's great. I, I think because you touch everybody you have that opportunity and I totally appreciated your commenting on the Inclusion Cafe um, notion and feel very passionate about it so thank you for supporting that. Questions? Yes. It, it, the, so the question is, is there any focused effort, right, in terms of, op, uh, in terms of which media platforms we work with? Um, a lot of it right now is based on where the demand is from the CPGs in particular. So as you can imagine, it's the big ones, uh, and it's, it's, there's a lot of demand for Facebook and Meta right now, uh, and then there's a lot of demand for our owned uh, properties, which is our website and our app, uh, and then you know starting to branch off into CTV, which is a very broad kind of video marketplace that gets really interesting for us, because then you can start to see where multiple types of programming and media content will be part of what we bring to the market. Yeah. Seems like there's a big opportunity for Albertsons to really grow its retail media network and encroach upon some of the space of like the big three. And I'm just curious if how you're thinking about that and, and and forgive me, I came in a little bit late, so if you've talked about this already, I apologize. But anything about uh, your ambition and, and vision to get there? Yeah, I think that the, there are a couple of ways that we can lean in on the big three in particular. Um, and part of it is the starts with the spirit of partnership. And that um, I think that the, and again, I grew up in the industry, so I've had all these meetings, all these conversations with the big three, um, and we've all had them. I, and I think that they're, because of our business model and how we operate, and because we have so many other relationships in the marketplace, because of the merchant relationships out there, we have an opportunity to really lean into this trust and transparency way of building relationships that is pushes against a lot of this, I'm gonna win and you're, you'll lose if you don't come and spend with us. Like, we will never say that. Um, though I do know that right now, retail media does feel like a tax to a lot of CPGs so that they feel like they have to pay in order to get their product on the shelf. And that's something that all of us are really leaning against because we have to show our value 
for the media spend alone. And when we crack that, that's part of what standardization is meant to do, then we can really lean into the trust and transparency piece that is so important to each of us. Uh, and it's a big part of the dialogue. And I think a big part of where Shopper versus RMN, you know, comes in. More questions? Tom, or Tom. oh, Kristen. I've read about uh, some in-store innovations that I think are pretty cool, like cooler screens. Um, what is an in-store innovation that you're excited to see kind of come to life at Albertsons? Well, here's the thing that I'm, we're really leaning into is the um, ad-serving platform that can push the content out to whatever forum format of in-store that we have. So any of you, um, if you've been in this space, there's cooler screens, there's the deli screens, there's the ticker on the shelf that looks like Times Square banner. Um, and the, the issue is how do you serve the ads to all of that, the, the fuel pumps? Um, so to, because it's such a fragmented marketplace, it's incredibly complex for us to build the scale in that space. And so we've been talking to some of the companies that are leaning in to be the ad server for all of these different formats that are out there so that we can scale really quickly and make it efficient for everybody to participate. So I, I oversimplify and this freaks our product people out. I just push the button <laughs> and suddenly the ad magically appears in whatever format it's supposed to appear in. Um, and then we can scale at a much faster pace. Because right now we've got one manufacturer that can give us, you know, a thousand screens to hang in the deli and then I got to go to another one to get the other 2,000. And it's like patchwork uh, and it's really inefficient. Shameless plug, but I will tell you we own uh, In Stadium, which is a live event uh, network and we face an interesting you know dilemma where we're trying to standardize on the one hand and on the other hand offer that kind of so maybe we should team up yeah if, if you've got the, you got the answer <laughs> i'll help you scale it that's awesome <laughs> i'll tell you take you up on that so with so many um retail media networks popping up uh, What's your take on data clean rooms actually being kind of a, a possible solution to unify data across the customer profile? Yeah, we're doing a lot of work with uh, clean rooms right now, and uh, we're using them more with media partners. So that we, you know, and we announced a couple of months ago our partnership with Pinterest, and to be able to match our data with their pinner data, um, and then to be able to show, do the close loop reporting, we can show that Pinterest pinners are actually, sh you know, the shopping that they're doing is super interesting. I actually think to the earlier question about the agency holding companies, that could be a really interesting place for them to take the data that they currently have, especially think of what IPG is and invest has invested in and ha has publicists. So you take kind of these um, data uh, companies that have been around forever, and now you can start to think about ways to bring first party data, high fidelity data to match to it. It suddenly gives that database a whole lot more value than it even had before. So there's going to be a lot of innovation that's going to come in that space. I think some of the things we need to be careful of is, you know, the data privacy. Um, and also eroding what is probably our most valuable asset, which is our customers and then what we know about them through the first party data that we have, making sure that we don't ever step over a boundary and a commitment that we've made to them. But we, have, we see a lot of promise in that. A lot of people are setting up in live ramp right now, but I know that um, there are really great competitors coming into the marketplace that we're keeping a close eye on. As a perennially curious female leader, looking at two amazing female leaders sitting up there, any, this is a total non sequitur and has nothing to do with retail media, but any leadership tips from either of you, uh, you for the modern workplace? Um, I, I think the thing that's always on my mind is what's happening in the middle, meaning we we have more women graduating with advanced degrees. We have more women in the marketplace. We have more women entering either our industry or any industry for that matter. 
and they kind of get to the middle and fall out. And the thing that I worry about most often is, you know, not only is that a disappointment to the industry, any industry, it's also a sort of a big waste of time in some ways, right? Because you kind of put all this energy and effort into this aspiration and dream, and then somehow we're not fulfilling that. And so I think the thing that I worry about most often is, are we reaching back, making sure we're pulling people through? Um, and are we nurturing the creative side of women coming into any industry, our industry in particular, um, who not only know how to show us how to deal with work-life balance, but in some ways, they're really great partners now in the family situation, you know, regardless of who your partner is, and they can really show us something. And I think as a leader, I'm constantly trying to understand what I can learn from the middle leaders, female leaders in the marketplace. And um, for me, and this is something that even, it's, it's not a female thing as much as a responsibility as a leader, um, I am hyper aware of the systems and structures that make the system work for some and not for others. And um, one of the things that I um, have our team working on right now is, you know, if you like the term or not, is the paper ceiling. And we've gone out of our way to make sure that we hire people who have stepped out in the middle and need to find a way to get back in or was never in a situation where they could go through, you know, the university system and then come out of the other side of the algorithm that screens the resumes before a phone call is made. And we are finding some of the most valuable talent as a result of um, being purposeful with making sure that we reach around some of the systems and structures that have been in place forever that, you know, Laurel and I have certainly pushed against, but many of the people in this room today and, you know, at this event have pushed against. And we are still way out of balance. And uh, I feel responsible for doing what I can to break that down. I think the good news is we're really starting to talk about it in a big way. I feel like we, we had a conversation yesterday about just um, the disability marketplace and how we can pull that marketplace through a passion topic for me, certainly. But, you know, let's pick every audience that we are here to talk about this week and actually take action. So I thank you for your action, by the way, um, and appreciate that. Your question, Sam. I love learning from amazing people. Oh, thank and you. Not, you know, specific, but just talking to people. <laughs> cool. Anything else? Should we wrap up? Well, thank you for being an amazing audience, Christy. Such an honor. Yeah, it's so fun to spend time with you. Yeah, again. I know. <laughs> Finally, we had to come here. Um, but um, really, I, I learned a lot, and I really appreciate the time. I know your agenda is super full this week, and um, I would say take a beat. Um, and thank you again for all your wisdom, and I look forward to seeing what you guys are going to do next. It thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Laurel. Cool.